Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Teaching Music Remotely. My name is Heather Young Mandujano. I spent a long time at the Cleveland Institute of Music where I worked in the distance learning department, connecting to musicians in classrooms all over the world using technology very similar to this. I would definitely say this is my field of expertise if I have one. Currently, I am an instructional technologist and I work with faculty at colleges every day to help them implement technology into their courses. And we are living in unprecedented times. I don't think any of us have ever seen a situation like this before. I talked to my 90 year old grandmother yesterday and she said she's never seen a situation like this before. But I just want to rest assured with everybody, we are going to get through this one way or another. It might not be easy and it might not be perfect, but I'm going to do everything that I can to help connect you with resources that are going to help you to in some way teach your students and continue to move forward until we're able to sort of resume life as normal whenever that may be. I will say that I am very thankful that we are living in the year 2020 where this technology is so prevalent that we all have access to some form of communication, even if we are isolated in our homes for the foreseeable future. And I think, you know, if you think that if we were trying to do this even 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we'd all be panicking a lot more. So let's all just take a deep breath and remember that we are fortunate that our students have devices, most of them, that will allow them to be able to connect to us in some way, shape, or form in order to do whatever learning they can during the short-term period that we are all going to be isolated. I do want to remind everyone that everybody's situation is different. I know we have some college professors connected. We have some middle school teachers connected. Some people are teaching private lessons. Some of you are teaching large ensembles or music theory or classroom things. So not everything that I say today is going to pertain to every single person. So please take this as I am offering you the information and the knowledge that I have. If something pertains to you and you want to use it, by all means, please do that. If you realize, hey, this part doesn't pertain to me or I don't see how this is applicable, or even if you just don't like what I say, that's fine. Feel free to ignore me. But I just want to share my expertise. And if this helps even one person to feel a little bit more confident or to learn a couple of tools that they can use going forward, then I think my time spent this afternoon is going to be worth it. I do want to just remind everyone, um, this has been a message going around at my college the focus here, first of all, it is short term, even for those of you that are looking at the rest of the term or the rest of the school year as doing some sort of remote learning. This is not going to last forever. And the focus here has to be on completing whatever learning objectives you have for your students. I know those of you that are teaching in a formal school environment, whether that is in a K-12 school or at a college, you probably have much more stringent guidelines. For those of you that are teaching just private lessons, you're going to have a lot more flexibility as to what you're teaching and realize that you will see your students again, life will resume as normal at some point, and you'll be able to kind of make up some things then. So focus on what you can do, be creative, and don't be afraid to experiment. Worst case scenario, you try something and it doesn't work or it's a huge flop, you just learn from that experience, you move on and you don't do it again. And that's something that I've learned in over a decade of working with technology and teaching through technology. It works most of the time. Every once in a while, you have a situation that just completely blows up in your face. And all you have to do is learn from that, try again, tweak what you need to tweak, and just keep trying to make it work. So I hope that those words are encouraging to you as we're moving forward this afternoon. I'm going to divide our presentation into two sections, synchronous learning and then asynchronous learning. For those of you who might be new to this, synchronous learning is when you are essentially in real time with your students as we are doing right now. You all can see and hear me as I'm speaking to you and I can see and hear, well, not here at the moment, but if you unmuted, I would be able to hear you as well. So this is happening more or less in real time. There is a little bit of a delay, which I will talk about in a few minutes. And then asynchronous learning is something that is happening not in real time. So perhaps you are posting an assignment for your student to do someplace, they're completing it on their own time, and then sending it back to you for feedback. 
or perhaps your student is recording a video or an audio file of themselves, and they might be uploading that to YouTube or sharing it through your learning management system or even emailing it to you. And so the, you might then give feedback in a variety of different ways. So that is an example of asynchronous learning. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about both of those. My expertise lies mainly in the synchronous realm. That's where I've spent most of my time. But I've also spent a good bit of time building online courses using both Canvas and Blackboard. Those are probably two of the most popular learning management systems out there. There are free versions of those as well. So I'll talk a little bit about how you can set that up. As we are exploring all of these different options today, I'd like you to think about your student's perspective and try and consider what some of their limitations might be. That's going to vary greatly depending on the population of students that you teach, their age, resources that they are likely to have available to them, and also keeping in mind it's not just students but also their parents that are really kind of going through a lot of these last minute changes that we're all being forced to make. Many parents are now working from home. That may lead to less bandwidth for everyone on their internet, for example. Um, things that you want to keep in mind are probably first and foremost cost. The last thing you want to do is tell your students, yes, we're going to continue to have lessons, but you need to invest $500 in all of this equipment. Try and keep that in mind and use the resources that you think your students are already going to have. Whatever equipment they have available, try and work with that as best you can. Be really flexible. As far as internet goes, I teach at a community college. We don't always, not all of our students have regular access to the internet. Some of them are trying to complete their degree program on their phone and they have data limits. I know that there are a lot of companies, I know um, Spectrum and uh, Comcast are both offering free internet to students in need at the moment. T-Mobile just announced in the last day or so that they are completely eliminating their data caps. So there are some options available, but please try and keep in mind that other people in the student's house need to maybe share a computer, share an iPad, share the equipment that they have, and share their bandwidth. So the more that you can be flexible with things, the better. And then also just keeping in mind time. Um, a lot of times we think we've created something for our students that is going to take 15 to 30 minutes for them to complete. And due to their own technological limitations, it might in real reality take a lot longer than that. So the more that you can provide flexible options for students to complete assignments in different ways, you might have a little bit more success with that. And then finally, I just want to remind everyone, be easy on yourselves. I know that as musicians, we tend to be perfectionists. A lot of us tend to be perfectionists, especially those of us who are more in the classical realm. This is not the time to let perfect be the enemy of the good. Do the best you can. Be pragmatic do what works for you and what works for your students. And above all, just be flexible and realize that this is extremely extenuating circumstances. And if you're giving them something, that's better than giving them nothing. So hopefully my words are reassuring and this is something you can take away and pass on to your colleagues. So we're gonna dive right in. I'm gonna start off by talking about synchronous virtual learning. This is of course the most similar replication to face-to-face. If you're connected to just your student, it's very easy to just have a conversation in real time. That's what these programs are designed to do. In addition, one major advantage is that many students are already using FaceTime. They're already using Skype. They're already using Facebook or Google Hangouts or whatever platform it is. They're relatively, especially if you're talking about students, say 30 years old and younger, they're pretty adept with this stuff, most of them. So that's definitely an advantage. There are some disadvantages. Of all of the ways that you can deliver your content, this is going to use the most data. So if you have students with limited internet or data caps on their internet, on their phone, those are some things that you wanna keep in mind and touch base with your students and have them let, let you know if they're getting close to that limit because it's not, especially for K-12 and college teachers, it is not just you that is working with your students right now. There are a lot of people trying to do these types of connections and that's really gonna drive those numbers up. It's important to use trial and error to find a combination of hardware and software that will work. There are a lot of factors that go into the success of a connection. I'm going to get into that when we get to technical specs in a few minutes, but 
be aware that there needs to be a little bit of a period of maybe the first time you connect, you're spending a lot of time kind of trying some different things, testing some things out and seeing what works. So you want to build in a little bit of extra time into your instruction for that. If you want this to be highly successful, you and your students are going to need to make some type of monetary investment. The best thing I can tell you is to use an external microphone. I'll talk about some specs in a minute and also to use a hardwired internet connection. So those are just a couple of things to keep in mind. And I also wanna mention that this is not really synchronous. There is a little bit of a delay and I'll explain to you how that works. Um, so right now I know you guys are all muted, but if I just clap my hands, I'd like everyone to just clap your hands along with me. Okay, so as you're doing that, it feels to you as though we are clapping in time with one another because you are following me. In reality, under the best case scenario, we have a half a second delay happening in this call right now. So as I am clapping my hands and you are clapping along, if I had your microphone turned on, I would hear you coming back to me about a half second, maybe as far of a lag as one second later, because my sound has to go to you and then your sound has to come back. So if you start to try and play a duet with your student, for example, or try to accompany them, you're gonna start off and think everything's great. The second that that student starts to play or sing along with you, your gut instinct is going to be to slow down and try and catch them. And that's the worst thing you can do because then they hear that and then they react to you. And before you know it, it, it is honestly a mess. I would avoid that situation at all costs unless you are really, really adept at kind of ignoring that lag time. And that's something you might want to experiment with. I would encourage that. But I promise you it is real and it is almost unavoidable. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this because it is not a feasible option for many of you. I'm just going to quickly um, open up a tab here and then I'm going to share it with you. Um, there is uh, a, some guys in Italy that came up with this low latency solution for specifically for music. The URL is lola.contes.it and they have created this low latency system. It works up to 1500 miles. You can play in real time with people. It is really, really cool. You also need to get plans from these guys to build a supercomputer and your students would need to do the same. I realize that is not at all a feasible method for pretty much all of you. So to that end, I would really discourage you from trying to go that route and trying to do the real time playing. There are some apps out there. Um, there's Jam Kazam and I think Jammer is another one. It's not the same as being in the room. You don't get the visual cues. You don't get the breath cues. It's more like both of you are playing along with a synchronous metronome. So feel free to try those apps. They're really cool. You could have your students do some great collaboration pro um, projects with those, but it's not going to be the same as trying to play in real time. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that as a limitation of this technology. All right, we have a question coming up. Is there some sort of option for students to get accompaniment files for solos? Yes, and that is on my list of things. We're going to get to that in just a couple minutes. Thank you, Sean, for asking. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some technological best practices. I will get into some of this accompaniment stuff in just a minute. Um, there are a few options for that. One really great thing, this is also slightly off topic, but very related. Many, many, many ed tech and music tech companies are making their products available for extended free trials right now during this period. I've heard many saying this is free for 60 days. This is free until the end of May. Take advantage of that. If there's ever anything you just wanted to try, either for yourself or for your students, just get a free account. Don't be afraid to experiment. Talk to your colleagues. See what's out there. See what's working. Um, yeah, so just there's a lot of options. And I think this is actually a really great time to kind of push us out of our comfort zones. If one good thing comes out of this whole situation, I think it is that. All right, so some best practices for working synchronously with your students. First of all, familiarize yourself with the platforms that are available. By platform, I mean the program that you are running this with, such as FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, WebEx. Real Presence is a favorite of mine, which I will talk about in a minute. Familiarize yourself with them, download all of them, test them all and see what works. You could, if you have um, somebody else in your house that can help you out, have them connect on one machine, you connect on another one, play your instrument, ask them what it sounds like, do some tests. You can kind of figure these things out on your own before you figure out what is going to work best for you and your students. 
as I mentioned before, Different platforms may work better for different students, depending what type of hardware they're using to connect and depending on the quality of their internet connection. So please offer them options if you can and try to be a little bit flexible about that. Always, 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 I cannot stress this enough, test ahead of time. Make sure that you are testing the connection with your students. Try some experiments. Try different microphone placements. Try as many different options and variables as you can think of and see what's going to work and see what is going to be most comfortable for your student to work with. There are sound limitations on most platforms that you are using. All of these, with the exception of Polycom Real Presence that I mentioned, are designed for a speaking conversation as we are doing now. To that end, there are some limitations to reduce the amount of audio data that are going through the connection. Video takes up a ton of bandwidth and a ton of data. Audio, not so much, but they try to limit that. If you tried to limit the video, we'd have a really kind of you know, not, not great video connection. But most people, if you're just having a meeting where you're talking with people, it's maybe more important that you're seeing their PowerPoint slides or you're seeing their facial expressions than it is that you are hearing every single fluctuation in their tone of voice. So they've done a lot to kind of maximize for speaking, which does not help instruments very much. A couple of the big ones are one called automatic gain control. What that does is it takes the dynamic range and it squishes it in the middle. So anything that is super soft or anything that is super loud is going to just get cut off or compressed into this kind of mid dynamic range. Super helpful if you're talking. For example, if we're in a meeting and I have 10 people that I'm talking to and one person is a loud talker, it's gonna tone them right down and that's not a bad thing. Likewise, if someone's very soft-spoken, it's gonna give them a boost. It also helps with background noise. For instance, if my heat kicks on right now and there's a vent in the room, it's gonna cut that out. But if your student is playing very softly, it's gonna cut that out too. And so that, that is just one limitation. Um, the other is echo canceling. Some people have been mentioning that if you're trying to play or talk at the same time that your student is playing, you start getting all of this cutout happening. Um, that's really the system trying to design it so that one person is speaking at a time. It does not like it when lots of people are making lots of noise simultaneously. So that's just something to be aware of. And I'll give you some strategies to kind of work around some of those scenarios. One really good advantage that you all have if you're not doing online teaching currently is you have heard your students play or sing in person and you know what they should sound like and what they are capable of. You can use that along with some tests that I'm going to give you to establish a baseline and figure out what it is that you need to adjust for in your own hearing. You will start to establish this kind of for yourself. It is a skill that you can learn it's not gonna happen automatically, but the more you practice teaching online, you will get used to what is your student and what is the limitations of the technology that you're using. Now, I did bring flute up here with me today. Bear with me, I am coming off of a kind of sh overuse shoulder injury thing, and I haven't been playing much in the last month or so. But I do wanna give you a couple of tests that you can do with your students to establish that baseline and find out what is happening. This is also going to show you, because we're on WebEx today and this is not optimized for music audio at all, it's gonna give you an idea of what you might expect to hear from your students if you have not tried this yet. So the first thing that I would do is to have your students play a scale that demonstrates the full range that they have on their on their instrument. Do that at a relatively slow speed. And what you will probably hear, I'm guessing as I do this, is that the lower notes and the higher notes of what I play are probably going to get either cut off or very distorted. So I'm just gonna back up from my microphone a little bit and we're gonna just demonstrate a quick chromatic scale here. almost the entire range of my instrument. You can post in the comments what that sounded like to you. I'm guessing it probably wasn't great, um, but that has to do with that whole um, 
just the squishing of different frequencies and ranges into something that is more the range of the human voice. So you can expect those extreme lows and extreme highs to get either cut off or pretty badly distorted by the connection. All right. Hey, sound quality was better than Zoom. Maybe we're discovering something with WebEx here. That's good. That's good. All right. So lowest and highest notes were a little softer. So that's actually not too bad. All right. So now let's check dynamics. Dynamics tends to be a little bit worse than range. So what I'm going to do is play a note that is just kind of in like the middle to low range for me. And I'm going to start as soft as I can possibly play. I'm going to do a slow crescendo to as loud as I can possibly play. And then I'm going to do a slow decrescendo back to the soft volume again. And you guys can let me know what this sounds like. I'll be honest, I have not ever tested this in WebEx. I've tested in Zoom, I've tested in Skype, I've tested in Real Presence and a couple other apps, but not this one. So maybe we'll discover that WebEx is the way to go and that might not be too bad. All right, so here is a big crescendo and decrescendo. So typically what has happened, and you guys can let me know what you heard in the comments, typically what happens with this is that you'll hear like pretty soft and then all of a sudden it's really loud and then all of a sudden you hear nothing. That's kind of been my experience when I've tested things in the past. Um, not sure what you guys were getting there. You should have heard, uh, okay, so I heard it's kind of on the soft side, sounded good, equalized, okay. So you can tell I've got the intensity going, but you can't quite hear that full, like from loud to soft. Okay, and then the last thing I'm gonna demonstrate, and this is particular for flute players and really upper woodwinds in general, and really upper strings, any high instrument. Um, if I take a high note and do a kind of really gradual decrescendo, oftentimes what will happen is either it's gonna just cut it out completely, or after I stop playing, you might get that top note and it's gonna create kind of an audio loop. So we'll see what happens. All right, so you guys can let me know how that uh, sounds to you. Um, yep, audio loop. Yeah, that's typically what happens. That's the thing that um, you, you kind of just have to wait a couple seconds after they stop, it will go away. Um, but just be aware, if the student continues to play after that long high note and they just dive right into the next section of their piece, you might get some really weird kind of garbled junk happening there. So, and I hear someone saying um, very little difference, not much of a spike. So yeah, that's pretty much what I would expect to happen. All right, so how can we optimize this and make the most out of your experience? Number one, hardwire your connection and your students for that matter. Use a laptop or desktop computer connected with a wire to your internet. Every time I switch internet service providers, which let's be fair, I do that about every two to three years because they always jack the price up and then I have to switch. I make them run a wire up to my office to my desktop computer for this exact purpose. They're always say to me, why can't you just use Wi-Fi? This is why. Use a hardwired connection. As for 4G versus Wi-Fi, if your student is using um, an iPad or their phone, if that's the only method that they have to connect to you, it varies depending on the Wi-Fi at the student's house. As you know, with Wi-Fi, the connection can very quickly deteriorate if somebody starts streaming Netflix in another room or if everybody is trying to do work at the same time, everybody is trying to video conference at the same time, that's gonna eat up that bandwidth pretty quickly unless you have a really, really strong connection. Um, sometimes 4G is better than Wi-Fi. Sometimes it's the other way around. I would say to try both and see what works for you on the platform that you're doing. A uh, quick aside, I did have a professor at CIM when I worked there who was doing some lessons back to Cleveland from her New York apartment. She was using the Real Presence app. We'd done probably half a dozen lessons with her before. They'd all been really great and sound was great. She could see and hear everything she needed to see and hear. One day, all of a sudden, it started freezing and the sound was getting really garbled. And we're like, oh, this is weird. Why is this happening? We start trying to troubleshoot. She says, hold on a second. She gets up, she walks away. Her daughter was downloading Netflix movies onto her laptop and that was using up their internet. And so she told her daughter to kind of stop for a second. So this is what we're going to be dealing with as we have whole families in a house all trying to vie for that internet connection. So just be aware, make sure your students are aware of that and do the best that you can to kind of try and mitigate those things. 
Um, using a USB microphone that plugs into your computer, or even if you get one that plugs into your portable device, that is going to make the biggest difference in the quality of the sound. I'm going to hold up the one that I have here in front of me. This is the Blue, or sorry, the Yeti microphone from a company called Blue. I've used this mic for a really long time. It's really versatile. It costs between $80 and $120 on Amazon. They do have some refurbished models to bring the cost down a little bit. The thing that I really like about this microphone is that, first of all, it's, as microphones go, it's not terribly expensive. I think that the audio quality on it is pretty good. And it also has on the back, I'm gonna hold this up, I don't know if you can see, right here, there are some different settings that you can use. I have mine set on cardioid. We'll talk about what that is in a minute. It also has gain control here. Since I'm talking today, I have mine all the way up. If I were playing, I might wanna notch that down a little bit, um, just depending on, on what I'm going to be doing. So it's a really good investment. If you have students, if you're teaching college, you have music majors, they really should have something like this anyway. So I don't think that's a bad investment. I also have a kind of mid-range Logitech, um, webcam set up and it has a really nice beauty filter on it. I'm actually, that was coincidental when I bought it, but um, I think it actually will help if you need to show a lot of detail work such as embouchure or fingerings, things like that. They'll be able to see better through some type of external webcam than not. And likewise for you. I think that if you had to choose between investing in the webcam and investing in the microphone, I would choose the microphone because I think it's more important to be able to hear the quality of the sound versus being able to see every single little detail. If they have a built-in camera and, you know, if you have an Apple product, the built-in camera in your Apple product is quite honestly, probably pretty good. Um, but that's just something that you might want to look into as well. Um, my camera also will allow me to replace the background behind me without a green screen so that, you know, if you want to mess around and have some fun with your students, you could put yourself anywhere and that could be a, a fun little advantage that you can do. All right. Um, Leslie's saying she just bought one from Google for 99 with a 10% discount. Yay, discounts. That's great. Um, headphones. I have here um, just some Sony headphones. Sometimes if your student is playing, you have your microphone in front of you, um, you can get some issues with the sound coming out, the mic picking it up. If you've ever done a connection where you kind of hear yourself coming back through the connection like a second and a half later, which is super annoying, um, that could be the cause. I'll talk about some troubleshooting for that in a minute. Um, headphones is a super quick option. If you don't have the speakers, you're not gonna have that problem. So if you and the student have some like halfway decent headphones, even you know a 20, $25 pair of earbuds can actually really help with that. So that is also really useful. Um, another quick thing is to hang up the call in between times. The longer the connection goes, the more the quality of your connection is going to deteriorate. So if you are doing five students back to back to back, make each one a new connection, hang up, dial back in, hang up, dial back in. I think it's good to give yourself maybe a five minute buffer or so in between students. Somebody asked that question in the um, Google form that I sent out. Um, definitely give yourself a few extra minutes in between and do reset your connection. Um, as far as I mentioned the pickup patterns on the mic, you want something that has a cardioid pattern or something that is not going to also pick up sound from behind you. That way, if you do have sound coming through your speakers, um, I have just some pretty decent Logitech speakers here in my setup. Um, the cardioid pattern is going to pick up the sound from here and here. It is not gonna pick up the sound that is coming towards the microphone from in front of me. So that will really help to kind of mitigate some of those issues as well. All right, Jim is posting a link, I presume. Oh, Audio-Technica AT2020, that's my second recommendation. Um, I was between those two when I bought this one. I chose this one because it has those different pickup patterns. I don't know if I'll ever end up doing podcasting or something different with it, but that is also a great recommendation and also not too expensive. I think it's also around 100, maybe $150, depending on where you buy it. So microphone placement, Depending on the instrument, depending on the student, depending on their setup, that's something you want to experiment with. For talking, you generally want the mic pretty close to you. For performing, you might want it farther away. I'm on a handy little wheelie chair, so if I were teaching, I might sit here while I'm talking. If I'm going to demonstrate, I might just scoot myself back over here. So that's something you want to kind of experiment with your students. All right. Um, I do want to mention just a fun little thing that not a lot of people are talking about, and that is a company called Polycom. Um, Polycom really focuses more on the audio side of their products, more so than on the 
visual side of things. So this is Polycom Real Presence. It is not free, but they have a 30 day free trial. Um, after that, I think a license, which I believe it's a one-time fee. Last time I checked, it was a one-time fee. The license is around a hundred to $120 forever. So if this is something you think you might do long-term, I recommend you can download a free trial here for whichever operating system that you have. The really, really cool thing about Polycom is they have this wonderful feature called music mode. All of those things that I talked about, echo canceling, automatic gain control, are really, really reduced when you enable music mode. So you can read a little bit about it here, and then I'm just gonna give you the very, very briefest tutorial of how this works. When I downloaded this yesterday and started my 30-day free trial, because I no longer have access to this through my job, um, it basically asked me for an email address, which I put in and I said, activate free trial. It then asked me to put in my company information, which I don't have. So I just clicked skip. You can skip that step. That's super cool. You'll notice down here, this gives me an IP address. That's what makes this a little bit more cumbersome than Zoom or WebEx or Skype. You do have to know the IP and you're actually like dialing the IP on this number pad. But the cool thing is that it has music mode. I have already enabled music mode by click. You can tell that because I have this uh, eighth notes up here at the top. The way that you do that is you hit pound. And then if for those of you that are my age and older, you might remember the old days of having to text with letters. Um, so you use the letters M U S I C, and then you hit pound again. And that is now turned off music mode. So if you want to put it back on, you do the same thing. M U S I C pound. Now music mode is back on. You could give your students your IP and they can call you if they have this app. Um, there is also an app from uh, that you can get for iOS or for Android. You cannot get live music mode on the mobile app. Um, however, if you have it on your desktop app, it actually really does help. Disadvantage with this um, is that the camera, at least on iPad, is on the side and this does not do the screen rotation thing. So that's a little bit of a disadvantage. Um, just quick note, if you need to get the IP address from here, um, you just tap the little I and it tells you down there. So feel free to experiment with that. I found it really helpful. Um, you will get a better audio experience using this app than any other based on the things that I've tested. Um, but feel free to just try it. If it doesn't work for you or if it seems too complicated, then ignore everything I said in the last three minutes. All right, let's talk about some practical teaching tips. Number one, do not try to play with your students for all of the reasons that we already talked about. There is a delay. They're going to get confused. You're going to get confused. You're going to have this cutting in and out. Just try not to do that if at all possible. Um, Sean mentioned some things about accompaniment. One option, if you play piano or someone that lives in your house does, you can make a recording and send it to them. That's one. Um, there are some YouTube recordings out there. That's option two. Um, another one is smart music. So um, if you're familiar with smart music, it's actually a really, really cool application. Um, let me see if I can find their website for you very quickly and I will share that. Smart music is offering a 60 day trial right now. Um, they have apps. Smart music has standard rep for most instruments in it. You can adjust the tempo and if you have a microphone set up, it will more or less follow you. So if you're doing something that's kind of rubato or if you're doing a retard, it will listen to you and it might take it, it might not be exactly perfect, but let's face it, neither are pianists some of the time. So it will kind of adjust to you as you're playing and that's a really big advantage to smart music. There's also some really great exercises and sight reading exercises in there. Um, it will show you music on the screen. It says one, two, ready, go. You can start playing along and it will actually grade you on your playing. You can record with it as well. Um, so, you know, it, it depends. I'm um, someone saying it doesn't have a great deal of college level literature. Depends on your instrument, I think, honestly. Um, sometimes, sometimes things are in there, sometimes they're not. But 
you know, check, check it out. It's free to try it right now. If it works for you, great. Um, the other one that someone mentioned to me, I have not tried it. It's called accompanist.com. Uh, I have not tried that one out. I'm told you can get accompaniments and you can do them at different speeds. So feel free to check that out if that's useful to you. Um, something that your students will need is a metronome on their end that is not on the same device that they are connecting with. Um, so if they're connecting through their laptop, they can use their phone. If they're connecting through their phone, they need something else to be their metronome. You should not start the metronome for your students on your end and expect them to play along because again, we have that issue with the delay and you won't really be able to tell if they're playing in time or not. Likewise, you can't clap along with your students to help them keep the beat or say one, two, three, four. All of that is off the table, so it's really important that they have a metronome and that they know how to use it. One really good best practice is to mute the connection or mute your microphone when your student is playing. The quieter you can keep things on your end while they play, the better. Okay, I see some uh, good uh, comments coming through, good suggestions. Fantastic, keep them coming. So mute while your student is playing and vice versa, have them mute while you are playing. That's gonna help to prevent a lot of that uh, glitchy stuff that happens. Try to sit really still and be very quiet while your student plays. This is incredibly hard. I have taught private lessons for 22 years and so often the student's playing and if you just give them a, a motion or you know help them, they follow along with those cues so easily in a face-to-face -face lesson. Remember the delay. That is not going to be effective working with your students through video conference. So sit quietly, let the student play. When they stop, then you discuss what happened, give them something to work on and resume. Um, all of that is, I know, tricky. Um, sometimes I help myself by just writing notes while they play and that kind of keeps me a little bit more in one spot. Assuming that you're muted while they're playing, or even if you're not, come up with some type of gesture, whether it's a cutoff or a, a hey, a jazz hands, whatever you wanna do, some type of signal to your students that it is time to stop playing because otherwise um, they might just kind of keep going, especially if they can't hear you telling them to stop. Have their scores in a pencil and paper ready. You can always just hold that paper up to the screen, write on it. Um, th those are just some really quick ways that you can give them some feedback and help them to see exactly what you're talking about since you're not there to point with them. Um, call and response learning is really great. You play, they play, or they play, you imitate what you heard them do. Uh, those are just some uh, probably the best strategy that I can think of as far as teaching through this technology. Ask the student to self-assess. If you ask them to really bring out the dynamics, say, how do you think you did? Um, you could also have them record something on a secondary device alongside that might be a little better quality than the connection that you have and have them email that to you later. And that could help you to kind of assess what you're hearing versus what's actually happening, especially in the beginning stages of doing this. Allow extra time. If you normally give your students hour lessons once a week, you might consider doing a 90 minute lesson every 10 days or so. Or if you normally do 30, le 30 minute lessons, do 45 minutes, work it out however works with you and your institution. Um, but more time is going to help because it just takes longer when you're dealing with all these things. And there's bound to be a few technical issues, trouble getting connected and things like that that are going to happen along the way. Um, focus on the things that you know you can hear really well. This is not the time to really talk a lot about dynamics, especially if you anticipate to be back to face-to-face -face lessons soon. So use the technology for what it's good for. Don't try and turn it into something that it isn't. All right, um, if anybody has any quick questions about synchronous learning, you can go ahead and post them now. We're gonna get into the asynchronous side of things in just a minute. Any cheaper mic options? Um, somebody mentioned to me a mic called the Snowball, which I think retails for around $60. Um, people have told me that they've used that for years with their students, it's really good. Um, you might look into that. Um, for iPad, I tried a mic once called a Mikey. I think it's from the Blue Company, which is the same as the Yeti. All right. Um, yes, depending on the type, the way that you're connecting and depending if you have a free plan versus a paid plan, there are numerous ways that you can have people do peer assessments and be connected at the same time. Keep in mind that's using a lot of data for a lot of people. If that's not an issue for you, by all means, go ahead and do it. You could also do that in an asynchronous manner where perhaps you're setting up a discussion board. You have the students record something and post and then they can comment on each other's recordings, which actually makes for a really nice transition into the asynchronous side of things. So thank you, Sean, for that. All right, so asynchronous tools. I wanna reiterate at this point that the most important part of this transition and this crazy scenario that we're all finding ourselves in is that you find a way to assess what your learning objectives are. 
your learning objective does not have to be taught by you sitting at the same place at the same time as your student. At this point, I mean, be creative. If you can assess if the student did A, B, and C, that's all you need. If that is them sending you an email, great. If that is them interacting with their peers, great. There's so many different ways that you can assess what they know. So I would just encourage everyone to be creative, think outside the box, create something fun and engaging for your students, and just try something. Um, so I'll talk about just a few different things here. One question a lot of people have been asking me lately this week is about ensemble learning. I know we have a lot of band directors, choir directors, orchestra directors. Yeah, put, putting your whole band on a WebEx connection and trying to conduct them is not going to work. Um, some things that you might do to help you achieve some of your objectives that aren't specifically that one. Um, you might have them listen to three different recordings of different ensembles performing a piece that you had previously been working with them on and have them compare and contrast, have them discuss it in groups, have them create a PowerPoint presentation about which one they like the best and why. Have them work maybe together or separately and have them create a video response that have them debate it. There's so many different things that you could do with that. That could work for solo literature as well. Um, you can perhaps have some sort of recording. There's probably a million copyright issues with this, but if you have a recording of the piece, you could upload that, have them record themselves playing along. Um, Audacity might be a really cool tool to do with that because they could add their own track on top of the Full piece track. Um, there's some different technology things that are getting involved with that, but in general, Audacity is a free piece of software, and I, I would recommend definitely looking into that for maybe some sort of recording project. Um, likewise, if you were having a couple of students working on chamber music, one could record a track, send it to the next one, they record their track on top, send it to the next one, and that could be a really fun way to do sort of small ensemble things without actually having people in the same room. Okay, is there a software that allows you to easily add a click track to a recording? I'm actually not sure about that. I'll leave this to the group. If you have a good answer for Nana, please feel free to add it there. Um, also, I am not above just Googling things when I don't have a good answer for something. Somebody on the internet knows more than you. So feel free to utilize your resources. All right, um, peer review is a really great tool. We talked about that a little bit. Um, that way you don't have to be doing all of the assessing yourself. And it also gets your students to actively engage with each other, even though they may be separated and quarantined to their own houses. Um, GarageBand better than Audacity. GarageBand is, to the best of my knowledge, only Apple. So if you have students who do not have an Apple product, they're going to need something else. Um, Audacity is not quite the same type of application as GarageBand. It's more of just an audio recording. There's not as much um, mixing and kind of plug and play types of things in Audacity. But I have found it to be a really useful tool. I've used it a lot. So feel free, it's a free download. If you wanna experiment with it, download it, check it out. I think it works pretty well and it's reasonably user-friendly. Um, Self-evaluation, have the student create a recording or even just play something. Maybe they have to keep a journal of their practicing and everything that they're doing. That, that could be part of your assessment. So don't feel that you necessarily have to meet with every student every week if you have time constraints behind what you're doing and that's not going to be feasible or if they don't have the technology always available to them. I wanna encourage you to think about the why behind everything that you're doing. I think a lot of times, um, especially if you're not in a college situation and you have specific objectives that you absolutely have to keep in order for transfer and things like that. Okay. So um, think about your why. Why is this objective important? Do they have to do it right now or could it happen at a later time when life is able to resume a little bit more as normal? And if this is really an important objective, think about how you can go about getting the students to demonstrate what they know when they are not in the same place as you. It could be written, it could be video, it could be audio, it could be collaboration, it could be a project-based learning thing. There's a hundred different things that you could do, but think about ways that you can do that. Um, talk a little bit about ways to deliver this. Um, there are two LMSs, that's learning management systems that I have used in the past. Both have free versions. If you're gonna go with a free version and you don't know anything about LMS, I would recommend that you use Canvas for two reasons. Number one, you get more courses that you can develop in there for free. I'm pretty sure it's unlimited because I have a free account and I have about 30 courses in there right now. There is a couple of gigabyte limit. So if you're putting a lot of videos, you wanna host those someplace else, perhaps YouTube, Dropbox, something like that and then provide a link or an embed code but 
Canvas is more user-friendly than Blackboard. You'll be able to create more courses um, depending on how you want to organize those things. So I'm going to go back to screen sharing. I'm going to jump over to Canvas. I'm going to jump over to Blackboard. I'm just going to quickly show you a few things that are possible with each of those applications. All right, so I have Canvas open here now. Um, this is a course that I designed for my master's degree capstone project. It was uh, part of the freshman colloquium course at CIM and I was doing a module on audience engagement and teaching. So I'm actually gonna show you guys this from student view because I think that's going to be a little bit more helpful. So if students walked into my class, I have this set up that they have to work through this in order. So right now, if I try and click on this pre-assessment, not gonna work. Um, so you can set up different modules and just have them kind of click through. You can add text, images, video, audio, assessments. Um, this is just a little quiz that I had them take as sort of a pre-assessment. Um, this is simple multiple choice. There are a lot of different question options. Pretty much anything that you would put on a test is going to be in here. You can now see it's shown me like what I've done and what I haven't. Pretty much they just have to view these things. Um, I did create videos. These are no longer available, but I had some interactive videos with um, different questions and things added into them. And that was really helpful. I had this organized by week. They can simply close or open. You could organize by grade level. You could do one course for each grade level. You could have a course for each individual student if you're doing private lessons. Um, but you can see there's a lot of different things here that the students can go through. Yeah, so I was doing a thing on um, learning styles. And I basically gave the students an option to do a little bit of a quiz on the different learning styles, which you click this link out to the quiz, and then come over here to report their learning style. You can set up a discussion board in here, but you could have the students interacting with each other. And there's a lot of different um, ways that you can work with that. Um, how much space is there available again? Flipgrid. Okay, I have not used Flipgrid, but I know a lot of people who have. It is a really great application. Um, that allows your students to do more of like video interaction where they're filming themselves on their phone and giving feedback. Students have found that really engaging. Highly recommend, even though I, I personally have not used that one. Um, how much space is available? Let me see if this will tell us. Uh, this says I have 262 megabytes on this one. So... That's standard for the free account. If you have a paid account, it obviously is going to go up to the many gigabytes levels. Um, but so that, that is one limitation of the free one. But the thing that is going to take up a lot of space in there is video files. So if you can host them someplace else, such as YouTube, Google Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox, Vimeo, any of those places, and have your students share a link from there, you can kind of get around that space limitation. Um, I'll show you guys just a little bit of Blackboard. My personal experience shifting to Blackboard from Canvas has been that it is not quite as user friendly, but it is learnable. Um, so Blackboard, you'll see it's sort of a similar setup. Um, instead of modules, they have course content. And it's kind of similar. They use more like this folder structure. So um, th this is me actually trying to recreate my freshman colloquium in here and I'm just kind of adding some different things. And also I was really messing around and just kind of messing with some stuff in here. Um, you can get discussion boards going in here as well. Um, it, it does basically the same thing. There's very few things in Canvas that you can do that Blackboard will not do. There are also some things in Blackboard that you can do that Canvas will not do. I have not tried the free version of Blackboard. Um, I have been told that it limits the amount of courses that you can have going at any given time. I think it's a relatively low number, like three courses or five courses. That said, um, I'm not 100% sure and I don't know how much storage space you get. So you could Google that, you could look it up, you could sign up for an account and see what it tells you. Um, but yeah, very good. Okay. Um, Students at university said not to use WebEx due to feed quality. Interesting seeing as you're having no issues. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, it could be, uh, yeah, there could be a million things going on. It depends. Right now, most of you all have muted your video. So that could be part of it if you have a lot of people with video going at the same time. Um, we use WebEx at my job all the time and we have not really had an issue with it. Um, but you know, do what works for your students. I, I'll reiterate again, pragmatism is your friend at this point. 
All right, so those are just kind of a very quick overview of the two LMS options. If anybody wants specific help with that, feel free to contact me after the webinar. I'll put my contact information in the um, chat in just a minute. Um, I'm assuming most people are familiar with basic file sharing sites such as Google Drive, OneDrive, or Dropbox. They all do more or less the same thing. So if you have access to one of those, I think most of you teaching at a high school or college should have access through your institution to either Google Suite or Microsoft Office Suite or Dropbox or some combination of that. That can be a really simple way to set some things up for your students. They can have access. The advantage to using an LMS like Canvas or Blackboard over top of that is that you'll be able to better track what your students do and you can do assessments in those pretty easily. Now you can use Google Forms for assessments. Some people are using Google Classroom. I have not experimented with that. Feel free to test it out, see what you like. My personal recommendation, if you're just looking for a place to put things, you want something that's pretty user-friendly, try Canvas. Um, I learned it myself in about a day, honestly. And it's pretty user-friendly, it's pretty intuitive, it's reliable. Um, there's a little bit, um, if you're using it independently, use it. you have to kind of manually import your students and give them some instructions on how to get into the course. But other than that, um, I, I found that to be a pretty good resource. Um, LMS stands for Learning Management System. So if you've ever taken an online course that was asynchronous and hosted on some type of web-based platform, they're using an LMS. Um, Canvas and Blackboard are the two most popular here in the United States. Um, D2L, which is Desire to Learn, is another one that a lot of people are using. Moodle also. Great. Um, let's see. Yes, both Canvas and Blackboard are sharing those. Absolutely. All right. Um, there's some information on Google Classroom. This is great. I love the collaboration that's happening. Um, YouTube it can also be great. Record some videos of yourself, whatever you want to do, lecture, capture, demonstrations. Put them on YouTube, send to your students. Email, let's not forget about simple email, that can work. And worst case scenario, you might have some students that just don't have access to reliable internet or technology where they are. Do what you can. I have heard of high schools in urban and rural areas that are making paper instructional packets available to their students. People were doing correspondence courses 100 years ago or more. And they found ways to still find ways to share knowledge with each other. Um, I talked to somebody at a flute masterclass thing that I was at many years ago, and she was talking about how she had taught people in the 1980s via correspondence. And it was a student who really wanted to study with her, and he recorded himself on a cassette tape, okay, a cassette tape, put it in the mail, sent it to her, she listened to it, gave handwritten feedback, and sent it back. Is it more time going back and forth? You don't get the immediate response? Yes. Is it possible? Also, yes. So that's kind of where I'm going to wrap things up today and just really encourage everybody, do what you can. Give your students as much resources and instruction as you can. Be flexible with them. Some of them may be dealing with more at home than you could possibly know if they have a family member who is sick, if their whole family is in their house and everybody is cooped up trying to share resources. There may be food shortages, money shortages as parents are off of work and those sorts of things. So please just, I urge you, be flexible. Do what you can. Try to be as creative and original as you can. And I think if there is one benefit of this crazy situation that I still cannot even believe we are dealing with, it is that we are all being forced to think about our craft in a new way. And if you can come up with even one really out there idea and it works, that is such an incredibly rewarding experience. And if your students say, hey, this is really amazing, keep doing it. You can do that even after we return to normal. So please feel free to take any of these ideas, share them to people. Um, I do have this call set up to go for a little bit longer. If anybody has to go, by all means do. If anybody has questions, I'm willing to stick around for another 5, 10, 15 minutes and answer as many questions as I can. So go ahead and type them in. All right. Looks like lots of appreciation coming through. Um, Vimeo instead of YouTube because of lack. Yes. <laughs> I also like Vimeo for that reason. Okay, we've got a YouTube going in here. Zoom, yes, great. Oh, I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but for those of you using Zoom, if you wanna optimize that application, when you connect, 
there is a button. I want to say it's in the top left hand corner of the screen. And it says something to the effect of turn on original sound. If you do that, it's going to optimize your audio. So that would just be a recommended setting that I would look into. There may be similar settings in other applications. I personally don't know, but that's something that you could look up or work with a colleague. Um, those of you that are at colleges, I highly encourage you. Okay. So I work as an instructional technologist. I am swamped. We're real busy right now, but we want to help. So I would encourage you to not shy away from reaching out to those people whose job it is to actually help you through these types of crises. So um, feel free to uh, reach out to anybody who is available to you at your respective institutions. Okay, option on Zoom to have the microphone adjust automatically. For playing, I would avoid that. That's going to be that, especially for dynamics. If you're having issues with bandwidth and connection, you might want to try. Um, again, that's a thing that you can check the setting one way, test it out, check it the other way, see which one you like better. So I, you know, I am all about experimentation and just trying to kind of freely think through a lot of these issues as we're all working through these issues together. Okay. Um, I have had, I have a Zoom recorder. I have not tried it in my computer as a microphone. I have heard people say that that does work. So I would, again, test it out. See if you like the result. A lot of students, especially college students, already have those devices because they're using them to make audition recordings and things like that. So if that is an option that they already have available, I would definitely suggest to try that first before you tell them to spend $100 on a microphone for sure. Okay. Automatic adjustment in Zoom apparently results in compressed sound. You may not hear super loud and soft. Yes, um, I would agree with that completely. So the more compression on the sound, generally, the worse it's going to be. So I would just encourage you to um, check that out for sure. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining me. Um, I'm going to quickly give everyone my email address here. If you have any questions, anything you'd like to discuss, I am happy to in whatever little amount of free time I managed to find in the next couple of weeks, help you out. Um, those of you that are at colleges, if you liked what you see, I do get consulting time off from my job. If you would like to invite me to do some sort of virtual consultation, obviously right now it's going to be virtual. Um, perhaps once this all blows over um, in the summer or in the fall, um, I would definitely be willing to come to your campus and work with your teachers, do a workshop, um, whatever you think would be helpful to you. Uh, I also have a whole presentation that I have done at Midwest. I've done it at OMEA. I've done it at Time. I've done it at Texas Music Educators Association and NAFME and a few others um, that is kind of testing out all of these different things. I believe that CIM most likely owns my intellectual property on that. So, uh, but I do think I could take my knowledge from that presentation and kind of put a new updated spin on it and uh, perhaps come up with some type of presentation about this, especially synchronous technology. So please feel free to reach out if there's anything that I can help you with. Um, the Facebook group has also been really useful and I am praying that the recording on this worked. <laughs> If it didn't, you all can be the disseminators of information to each other. And please feel free to share. I'm all about sharing. Um, I am planning to make this just an open Creative Commons license recording if I'm able to put it up. Um, as long as nobody is charging money to use my work, I honestly don't care. So please share, go out, have fun. Try and enjoy this experience for whatever it's worth. Sometimes experimenting and trying new things can just really get you out of a rut and help you to just enjoy things a little bit more. So Great. We're going to wrap things up there. Thank you. Uh, print of this chat. I will see if I can do that. Probably. Um, if nothing else, I'll be able to get somebody some kind of screen capture or a PDF or something. So thanks all so much. Um, please keep collaborating. Hang in there. And we are going to get through this together one way or another. Good luck.